machine, which if thoroughly learned and intelligently handled, is a speedy and reliable means of transport under almost all conditions. A motorcycle is made up of a number of parts, each one having its own job. It's a straightforward machine, readily accessible, and certainly not difficult to understand. Let us examine a typical model and get a general idea of how the wheels go round. The tank contains the fuel, petrol, which runs down a pipe to the carburetor. From the carburetor, the petrol is sucked into the cylinder and a current generated by the magneto is sent along an insulated wire causing a spark in the sparking plug which ignites the vaporized petrol and air mixture and pushes down the piston inside the cylinder. This diagram will explain how the four-stroke cycle is applied to the motorcycle. The petrol and air is sucked in, compressed, fired by the spark and pushed out through the exhaust. Induction, compression, power, exhaust. Induction, compression, power, exhaust. The spark at the plug explodes the mixture which pushes down the piston. This in turn pushes down the connecting rod which is attached to the main shaft which drives the chain connected to the gearbox. From the gearbox, another chain transmits the power to the rear wheel. That gives you a very elementary idea of the workings of a motorcycle. These movements are controlled from the handlebars, so we'll examine the different controls. On the left are three controls, ignition control, exhaust valve lifter, and clutch lever. This is the ignition control lever. It is used to advance or delay the spark which ignites the vaporized petrol which you saw in the diagram just now. On this machine, you advance by moving it towards you and delay by moving it away from you. On some machines, the actions are reversed. Underneath is the exhaust valve lifter which raises the exhaust valve off its seat and allows the piston to be moved over compression for starting. This cutaway model shows the exhaust valve on the right as it is being raised off its seating. The exhaust valve closes when the lifter is released. Here is the clutch control. By moving it like this, the clutch becomes disengaged and so allows the rider to change gear. A skeleton clutch shows the action of the clutch plates as they are opened and closed. On the right are three more controls, the air lever, the throttle, the front brake. On top is the air lever controlling the strength of the petrol and air mixture. Toward you is the open position to weaken the mixture for normal running, and away from you is the closed position to enrich the mixture for starting. The throttle control is a handlebar grip which rotates round the handlebar. It governs the speed of the motorcycle. To increase the speed, it must be turned towards you. To decrease the speed, it is turned away from you. The last handlebar control is the front brake. In its normal position, the front brake is off. But gripping it like this operates the brake. In addition to handlebar controls, there are two others. One is the rear brake pedal. This is operated by depressing it in the direction of the ground, and so operating the rear brake. On the other side of the machine is the change gear control lever, which is used to select the gear required. On most machines, the position of this can be adjusted. Neutral and four gears are marked on the selector cover. One, two, three, and four. The gear control lever must work in conjunction with the clutch control. 
So for each gear change, the rider must declutch and lift the gear lever to the full extent of its travel to select bottom gear. When the gear is engaged, the clutch control is released. Now to change from bottom to second, and so on up to top gear. The only difference is that the gear lever control is depressed instead of lifted. The act of moving the gear lever, as you see in this skeleton box, causes the gear wheels to slide along the shaft. And each time a change is made, a new sequence of gear wheels is engaged. After each engagement, the clutch control is released. The same movements are used through the gear changes until finally top gear is engaged. Now for changing down. The gear control lever is lifted for each change. You will notice that the gear lever is moved to the fullest extent of its travel and with the toe of the boot. The movement of the gear lever to neutral is downward and comparatively short. On some types of machines, the selection of the gears is reversed. With this machine, for instance, you lift to change up into a higher gear and depress to change down. In other words, up for up and down for down. Before we proceed beyond the elementary stages, it must be remembered that all motorcyclists made a similar elementary beginning. Even famous road racing riders had to be taught the whys and wherefores of a machine before they could learn even to ride at all, let alone reach this pinnacle of riding control. This applies also to expert cross-country trials riders, where control is just as vital. Whether it's racing or trials riding, knowledge and concentration are absolute essentials. The foundations of learning to ride must be well laid, a bad habit at the beginning is very difficult to cure, but a good habit is never lost and it's just as easy to learn. Every one of those fine motorcyclists started his riding career like this, getting the feel of the machine when he got astride it for the first time. This pupil is already finding that the whole secret is a balanced machine with its weight in the right place, on its wheels. This elementary lesson is important because it helps to give the learner self-confidence. By wheeling the motorcycle about, you can get its weight and find that, though it is of course much heavier than a cycle, it is not unwieldy, but a well-balanced machine. As long as you can keep it balanced on its wheels, a motorcycle can be controlled with little strength. But once let it lean too much to one side or another, then strength, and great strength only, can save the situation. There is a right and wrong way of putting the machine on the stand. This is the wrong way, because he's trying to lift the machine. The motorcyclist must learn to manhandle his machine with a minimum of fatigue. It is so much easier to get behind the machine, hold down the stand with your foot, and pull it onto the stand, as the instructor has shown you. But you must be beside the machine with your right foot in front of the stand to pull it forward off the stand. By taking your first trip under man instead of machine power, you can soon learn to keep your balance because you only have balance to think about. The novice wobbles a bit on his first attempt, which is quite natural, but he still keeps his feet on the footrest. It is surprising how quickly the balance is found, and with that discovery comes your confidence. In addition, at this stage, you will learn to operate the brakes without looking or groping for them. The handlebars and footrests are adjustable, so be sure that they are comfortable. These obviously do not suit this rider. The handlebars are too low and they should be adjusted. 
That's much better. They're higher now, so that the grips come naturally to hand. Now for footrests. These are too high. They should be as low as possible to give the greatest comfort and the maximum control. They've been lowered now and in a position which allows the rider to poise himself on them without pulling on the handlebars. Don't sit with tense muscles and a straight back. This would mean your spine taking all the jolts. So sit well back and relax the muscles. A crouch is perhaps the most apt description. Adopt this position and you'll be able to cover long distances without fatigue. Delay the spark by retarding the ignition. Be sure you are in neutral gear. The kickstarter is next, so lean the machine against your left thigh. Place your foot on the kickstarter and press down so that the kickstarter mechanism is engaged. Continue to press down kickstarter until compression is felt. Just three more operations. Lift the exhaust valve lever to release compression. Slightly depress the kickstarter to ease the engine over compression. Release the exhaust valve lifter. With the actual start, he gives a long swinging kick assisted by the whole weight of his body, keeping his foot on the kickstarter and allowing it to return to its normal position. Another start, full weight of the body, left foot leaving the ground, but don't overbalance. This is better, but he should have held the kickstarter down until the engine fired. Another common fault with beginners is to jab at the starter with the foot sliding off. You can't get a full length kick and a backfire can cause a badly bruised or broken leg. It's not difficult if you always give a full length follow through kick. Now let's run over the movements again as a trained motorcyclist does it. The petrol is already turned on. The engine being warm, he doesn't flood the carburetor or the mixture will be too rich. So open the throttle a little, close the air, retard the ignition, find compression, raise the exhaust valve lifter, ease compression, then a long swinging follow through kick. Once started, the ignition lever should be fully advanced. When the engine is warmed up, it doesn't take long on most machines, the air control is opened to its full extent. This gives a normal running mixture. Normally, the throttle is now the only necessary control of speed. Turn it towards you to increase the speed and away from you to slow down. When a slow tick over is needed, retard the ignition. Now, for the first time, the learner is going to move the machine under its own power. Again, this should be practiced as a routine. Lift your foot from the ground to the footrest. De-clutch. Engage bottom gear and return your right foot to the ground. Now, increase the engine speed slightly by opening the throttle. Then, let in your clutch but not suddenly like that. Now, while the rider is restarting, here is a guiding principle for moving off smoothly. As you gradually let in your clutch, gently open your throttle at the same time, and that's what the instructor is telling this rider. The feet should be placed on the footrests immediately you're underway, and as you proceed, resist any temptation to put your feet to the ground. Your throttle now controls your speed. Treat it with respect, open it gently and close it gently, and always avoid the flashy use of the throttle so dear to the young, sporty boy with his first motorcycle. When the instructor leaves you, alone in the cold, hard world, keep your confidence. If you have retained the elementary lessons you've been taught, you have nothing to be afraid of. Once you've got balance, try to memorize where the controls are 
until you can use them all without any effort. Never slip the clutch. It's used only for stopping and starting, and once underway, for gear change. To stop at such a low speed as this, you declutch and immediately apply both hand and foot brakes together. Then select neutral. The gentleman vanishes. That's what happens to riders who not only miss neutral, but let their clutch in suddenly. Always engage your clutch gradually. A few straight runs with stopping and restarting after each run will give you good practice in the correct use of your controls. And you'll find that their use will become automatic. Proper use of clutch and throttle gives a smooth start. Now, for stopping, never try to stop the machine with your feet. Let your brakes do that. And only put your feet to the ground when the machine comes to a standstill. Continue practicing this stopping and restarting, and when you're quite confident, you can then leave the straight path and go on to curves. The best start is a wide circle, and this will teach you to control the speed of the machine and balance it at the same time. Be content with the larger circles and curves until you can control your speed without any conscious effort. That is, until you can devote all your attention to balance. When this stage is reached, progress can be made to smaller circles and figure eights. These smaller figures, by their restricted area, will obviously demand a lower speed, and there'll be the temptation to maintain balance by putting the feet to the ground. This temptation must be mastered, because riding feet up will automatically develop a natural balance, which is one of the main points of successful motorcycling. So far, only bottom gear has been used. Gear changing is the next stage. If you have to go on a road for this, choose an open road and a quiet one. Once underway, the second gear is engaged. So that you can see the smoothness of good gear changing, let's see it in slow motion. He slightly opens the throttle, disengages the clutch, simultaneously closing the throttle, and presses down the pedal. The clutch lever is slowly released and the throttle reopened. Once again, open throttle, disengage clutch and close throttle, depress pedal to full extent, release clutch and open throttle. In changing up, always use the sole of your foot, never the heel. And do not stamp, but press and make the movements deliberate. The whole movement should be almost imperceptible. All these principles also apply to changing down, the difference being that most movements are reversed. The gear lever, for instance, is raised with the toe of the boot, and this again must be a deliberate lift and not an upward kick. The sequence of changing down is withdraw clutch and open throttle, raise the pedal and release the clutch. See it again. Withdraw clutch and open throttle, raise the pedal, and release the clutch. The stop revives an early lesson, both brakes being applied, and you'll notice that his feet come to the ground as he stops, and not before. He also is experienced enough now to select neutral correctly. This practice in gear changing gives increasing confidence to a rider, and once it has been well mastered, you can devote your whole attention to the road, which may include bends and inclines. At first, keep to a steady speed and on a fairly quiet section of road, and always keep in your own quarter. A word of warning, however, as your confidence increases, do not be tempted to show off. The hallmark of good riding is make all movements in controlling your machine imperceptible and your progress along the highway unobtrusive. Remember, arterial roads are not racetracks, and roundabouts are made for the safety of road users, and not as a demonstration ground for flashy riders. So don't show off. 
So another step forward is taken, with the road and light traffic conditions being successfully accomplished. You are now ready to face busy traffic, and there's nothing like a town to give you that. This is where your study of the highway code should be most useful, as in your first busy traffic it is easy to give a wrong signal, like that. You know the system of traffic lights, and if you take it quietly there is nothing to worry about. You have complete control of your machine, and that gives you confidence. Another point, watch out for street signs, as there are many one-way streets in every town today. Towns are not always built on the level ground. There are often hilly streets on which you may have to stop. Restarting on a hill is therefore an important lesson, but it's better to learn this in the country. The rider is holding his machine with the front brake. The method of getting away is D-clutch, select bottom gear, transfer the braking to the rear brake, open the throttle, and as the clutch begins to take up the drive, gradually release the brake. This will give you a clean start. Let's see it again. Hold the machine with the front brake, D-clutch, select bottom gear, transfer the braking to the rear brake, open the throttle, release the brake as the clutch engages, and away you go up the hill. Another lesson has been learned. We'll get back to the level again and try bends and corners. Always remember this. Your speed must be regulated so that you can pull up well within the distance you can see ahead of you. This is most important when taking corners. And you should always have your machine well under control and ride within the limits of safety. This is how a rider should not take a corner. Take particular notice of the path he takes. He is also travelling too fast, making no allowance for taking the corner. He's a danger to himself and other road users. There is a correct path to take on all bends, and speed must be controlled before the corner is reached. Watch the rider's path this time, and see how he finishes in his own quarter of the road. The principles remain the same, whatever the road surface. To control your speed on a corner, apply both brakes well before the bend while you're on an even keel. Similarly, a change down should be made before the corner is taken, so that the machine can be driven round it. Now, here are the principles of path shown diagrammatically. For a left-hand bend, the machine should ease toward but not over the centre of the road. As it reaches the corner, it is heeled over to the apex of the bend and returned to its own quarter of the road. This means safety. So often, however, the inexperienced rider keeps close to the left-hand side of the road. The result is that he takes the corner blindly and, if going too fast, will shoot over to the wrong side of the road. Similarly, with a right-hand bend, there is a great temptation to get over to the centre of the road and cut the corner. Obviously, this is dangerous to both rider and oncoming traffic. Now see the difference when the correct path is taken. The corner must be approached in the left-hand gutter and the machine kept in the left-hand quarter of the road all the way round the bend. With an S-bend, the principles of cornering remain the same, with this exception. When the initial corner is right-handed, the machine, as already shown, is kept well to the left, but instead of remaining there after taking the corner, it is edged towards the centre of the road in preparation for taking the left-hand bend which follows. And that is all there is to safe cornering. Take it easily and deliberately. 
Practice and experience will enable you to take the correct line and judge the safety limit of all corners. The best way to accomplish this is to follow an experienced rider and by keeping to his path, you will not only learn correct cornering, but it will add polish to your riding. Sections of two to six riders will find that by taking it in turn to ride next behind the instructor, much can be learned even in short runs. You too will gain that confidence. Only experience, of course, will teach you many of the things the trained motorcyclist must know. But your practice on actual machines, plus your own keenness, will enable you to take your place amongst the capable and enthusiastic army riders.